Paul up to worship this morning comes from John chapter 4. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And um, I want to add my voice to those who have wished all the dads a very happy Father's Day. What an important task God has called you to. Pray that you do it with all vigor. Do not grow weary of doing good. In that regard, I'm also excited that today we begin the gospel according to Mark. And it's important that we do so. Before you turn to Mark, I do want to just use a quick reference in John to make a point about the unique nature of Gospels. And in John chapter 20, verse 31, is what I'm going to read first. Probably as more so as in as much now as in any age, we are facing a battle for the historical Jesus. We live in an age where most information about Jesus is much more a deconstructed Jesus. A world in which we shape and make Jesus in our own image. By deconstruction, what I mean is we reduce Jesus down to a phrase or a comment that we're pretty comfortable with, and then we act like that sums him all up. And if you do that, it's really easy, easy to paint Jesus as whatever you need him to be. If you're a pacifist and you need to be, you want Jesus to be a pacifist, meek and mild, it's pretty easy to do that with a deconstructed Jesus. Turn the other cheek. It's easy to reduce it down to that one phrase and say, well, that's, that's Jesus. That's his essence. That's his character. That's all of him in one phrase. Turn the other cheek. Well, that works really well if you're a pacifist or if you're a social justice warrior or you're a moralist or you just need him to be a fiction. And the Gospels present to us for our consideration the character and the essence of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, they present to us the character and essence of what it means to be saved. Because Jesus is the way, then understanding who he is shows you what salvation is. And John really speaks for all of the gospel writers when he says in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, referring to what he had written, he says, but these have been written that you may believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ. That's a title. means he is the chosen one. The son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. Why did he write the gospel? So that you may believe and that you may be saved. And that is going to be true for Matthew, that's going to be true for Mark, and that's going to be true for Luke. And they've done so in what is a really unique literary form. As I make my way to Mark chapter 1, I'll invite you to do the same. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today. With only a few departures. Gospels are a very strange literary form. They almost defy definition as a genre of literature. Most genres are pretty easy to spot. Historical fiction, thrillers, romance, horror, mystery, ghost stories, fairy tales, poetry. It's really quite interesting to read literary critics who are not believers try to qualify and classify and define exactly what literary genre the Gospels are. They just, they don't know what to call it. They don't know how to categorize it. It almost defies definition. And it's a very strange literary form because it 
feels a little bit like biography, but it's not a biography. It feels a little bit like historical narrative, but it's not a truly, um, in its purest form, in historical narrative. It has historical references. It refers to things that historically happened, but it's much different. It is a collection of episodes designed to present to you the Jesus to believe on so that you may be saved. That's what it is. It invites you with every line. It invites you with every word to ask, what is the nature and character of this man, Jesus Christ? And if I believe on him, what does that mean for my life? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You can't open this in the way you would a normal biography. In fact, Mark doesn't even start with his birth. It says nothing about his childhood. In fact, neither the other three Gospels say very little about his childhood. Maybe one episode. Because they're not biographies in the truest sense of the word. So here's how we're going to tackle them. We're going to take the Gospel of Mark and we're going to look at the episodes he presents and we're going to make sure we understand what's happening in them, who's in it, what are they saying, what is the focus. And then we're going to be asking ourselves continuously, what does this reveal about the character and nature of Jesus Christ and the salvation he offers? What does this reveal a bit to me about how I must be reconciled to God? And of course, the prologue, which is very short and the only real commentary that Mark offers, he's very hard hitting. He's fast. He is, he is intense. He's rapid. His favorite word is immediately, immediately, immediately. That's his favorite word. It comes at you intense and it comes at you hard and it comes at you fast. But he does open with a prologue and a chapter, the first chapter, that really kind of set the table for the entire gospel. And it begins this way. Look at Mark chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is the announcement of news. The word gospel in the Greek it basically refers to a type of news. And it's not like what news has become. Some of you who are my age and older, you can remember a day when if you were watching television and that little uh, image came up on the screen, a special news bulletin, you know, ABC News interrupts your regularly scheduled program to announce you knew that was something important. It's not like today with Scare Team 8 in Grand Rapids. It's February 3rd and we're going to get five inches of snow. That's not news. That's just simply not news. And of course, they follow that by please panic now. This is an announcement of news. And it's a news of a very definite character. In fact, there's six things that come out in this prologue about this news, and I just want to hit them very quickly. And if you, you picked, I hope you picked up a copy of the, the outline. You can kind of make notes for yourself, and I will, I will suggest some notes to jot down. But the first thing I want you to know about this particular news, it is good. This is good news. This is exciting news. I know today, you know, we're not in the habit of reporting how many airplanes land safely. But this is really good news. And by the way, it's, uh, it's not just news in terms of principles or beliefs or doctrine. It's going to include that. It's going to include things that you should believe. It's going to include things that are doctrinal in nature that should shape the way you live. But it's a gospel of Jesus. Number two, this is good news about Jesus. It is an announcement of the news of Jesus. It is his gospel. He is the gospel. The gospel is him. He is the way. He is the truth. To understand Jesus is to understand the salvation he offers. To understand that salvation is to understand him. Number three, not only is it good news, not only is it focused on the person of Jesus Christ. Number three, I love this. It's the beginning. Isn't that great? Isn't that great to think about? 
The Gospel of Mark is not the beginning, the middle, and the end of the good news. It's just the beginning of the good news. And that is so exciting for us alive today. We are just the next caretakers, trustees. We're the next generation up to have this marvelous gospel, to protect it, to defend it, to announce it, to proclaim it. This wasn't the beginning, the middle, and the end. This is just the beginning. Number four, uh, this is old. This is an old plan. He quotes from really a mashup of, he quotes from Isaiah, he quotes from uh, Malachi. He kind of mashes up this quote from the Old Testament. This is the only time Mark is going to quote the Old Testament in the entire gospel. And he wants us to know that this is an old message. This is an old plan. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. And we'll see whose way it is in a minute. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, that, that God himself is coming. And we need to prepare for that. And the messenger will announce that God is coming. And so we are to prepare for that and make pay, straight his path. This is not a new plan. This is not plan F. It's not like Abraham was in his... Son Isaac was plan A, and then maybe Moses was plan B, and maybe Day King David was plan C, and now we've worked our way to plan D. This, this was always the plan. This was always the plan. It's good news about Jesus. It's just the beginning of the announcement of this great news, but it's really old. In fact, that, that phrase, good news, that's a very Old Testament phrase. You can find it in Isaiah chapter 40, chapter 41, chapter 52, Nahum chapter 1, Isaiah 61. It all says there's good news coming, there's good news coming. The idea of gospel, you know, this, this idea of good news, that's what gospel means, good news. That's a very Old Testament idea. Number five, it's a way of life. This is, this is going to be, you know, Jesus says, I am the way. And we see that twice. And once in chapter, in verse 2, he says, uh, prepare your way. And then, of course, that's the way of the Lord. Make ready the way of the Lord. And then, of course, we're told that Christ is the way. This is all about a way of life. To understand the Gospels, to understand this is going to be the way you live. And, of course, number 6, finally, the announcement of the good news from a, a trustworthy messenger, a reliable messenger. There's one coming in the wilderness, it says, a voice crying out, get ready, make your way straight. Well, then we come to what's really the first episode of this gospel. There's not a conjunction. It's like he doesn't go and John the Baptist in verse four. He doesn't say and the messenger was John the Baptist. He just announces that there is a voice coming, crying in the wilderness, saying, make way, the Lord is coming, make straight his paths. And then we just announce who the messenger is. And the first episode is this way. Listen to it as I read verses 4 through 8. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him. And all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, after me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So let's talk quickly about this episode. It's really quite simple. It's not particularly complicated. John is described. He's described 
in a very strange way. First of all, number one, the first thing he's described, we're, he, we're told what he wears, his clothing. We're told that his clothing, coming for candy now, Nathan, is that what it's all about? This is all about? <laughs> the altar calls later, Nathan, just hang on. <laughs> Don't get on stage with animals or little children, okay? That's that. Now, we're told about his clothing. And we're told he wears <laughs> clothing made of camel's hair, a leather belt. So the first thing we're told is his clothing. And uh, I think that's probably uh, significant for a couple of reasons. But number one, it's, it really tr draws your attention to how strange this is, doesn't it? Listen, this would have been as strange in 30 AD as it sounds to our ear in 2024. None of their priests dressed like this. You know what they're used to. They're used to Pharisees with long robes and bells on the ends of the robes and these very interesting hats and this kind of almost a scarf. Nobody's priest dressed like this. This is bizarrely countercultural. <laughs> and it is intentionally not following what they would expect from someone announcing the coming of God himself, the Lord. Make ready the way of the Lord. So the first thing we're told is he, uh, he doesn't dress like anything they've ever seen. And number two, we're told some strange things about his diet. Now the honey part's not that strange, but the wild locust is a little bit strange. By the way, in the laws of Leviticus, it was perfectly fine to eat locusts. Perfectly fine. Nothing sinful about that. But I will tell you this, it's certainly a contrast with what the elite classes were eating. They were not eating this. This is quite a contrast. And then finally, we're told that he's a baptizer. His ministry is baptizing. Now we're going to talk about what he's proclaiming in a moment, which is by far the most important thing, but that's a little bit strange too. Uh, the word baptizo has existed for almost a thousand years before Christians started calling the ritual of what you and I think of as baptism, baptism. What kind of ritual washing was it? Well, certainly the priest in the Old Testament engaged in ritual washings. Certainly there were the Essenes of that day. It was very popular to do this kind of ritual washing. But we see that what he's known for is to be out in the wilderness, away from the cities. People are traveling a long way. It's not super convenient to get to him. And a great many of them are doing it. They're coming from Judea. They're coming from Jerusalem to be baptized. But what is the proclamation what does John proclaim with this baptism? Well, this is critical. It is a baptism for the repentance of sin. It is a call to righteousness. It is a call to turn from their sin. This is the messenger of Christ. He is setting the table for the arrival of Jesus. And what is his message? Repent from your sin. Be, be righteous. And then he adds, that's the first part of his message. What does John proclaim? Number one, repent from your sin. Turn from it. Forsake it. Engage in righteousness. But then he adds a couple of other things in his message. He's the messenger after all. He's the forerunner. Number two, he says that uh, he says, I'm declaring one who is mighty. In verse seven, he says, there's one coming who is mightier than I. He is declaring the mighty one. And then finally, number three, he tells us something about the mighty one. The mighty one's going to baptize, but not with water. He's going to baptize with the spirit of God himself. He's going to baptize with the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, this reveals a lot about the character and nature of what Jesus is going to do and who he is. But understand this. <laughs> From the announcement of John the Baptist 
we are going to be introduced to and we are going to see a repeated over and over again call to righteousness. Jesus, the nature of Jesus is to make you righteous. That's what Jesus is about. That's what he is about. That's what his ministry is going to be about. What is revealed about the character of Jesus, the, the salvation that he offers? He is going to make you righteous through the power of God. The Holy Spirit is going to baptize you. And it is a call onto repentance and righteousness and the forgiveness of sins. And doesn't that sum up beautifully the ministry of Jesus Christ? He's come to make you righteous, to call you to righteousness. Well, let's look at episode number two. It's also equally important in setting the stage. It is the baptism of Jesus. It's recorded in just three verses by Mark. Verse 9, And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, there's Mark's favorite word, and immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. So the first thing he announces is where Jesus is from. And he is from, uh, quite frankly, nowhere. <laughs> he's from nowhere, he's from nowhere, Galilee. He's from Nazareth. In fact, Nazareth is so small that it would not have shown up on any maps in the Roman world. And in fact, because we believe Mark probably is writing, he's certainly writing to Gentiles. They knew Latin. They certainly were already probably Christians. They knew a lot about Jesus and they knew some Latin. So they're almost certainly Gentile Christians, probably in Rome. He says, I know you can't find Nazareth on a map. So I'm going to say it's Nazareth in Galilee. You'll probably be able to find Galilee on a map. It's no surprise that one of Jesus' own disciples is going to say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is not a one, this is not a one, one horse town. This is a no horse town. They don't have just one. They don't, they don't even have the one blinking yellow traffic light at the intersection. It's, it's really nowhere. And then he's baptized, and we're told almost nothing about that. Mark is not really interested in giving us the details of the baptism itself. We're not told about any announcements of anything he said before the baptism or after the baptism. Everything about this draws us to the reaction of heaven. What is the reaction of God to this baptism? And it is stunning. Three things heaven does as a reaction to this. Number one, my translation like yours says that the, we, they says they saw the heavens open. Uh, opening is almost, the word really means ripped. Heaven ripped open. The next time Mark will use this word is when the veil in the temple ripped from the ceiling to the floor. It, it suggests almost an irresistible reaction from God in heaven. The very heavens are going to react to the announcement that Jesus is here to begin his public ministry. And it just rips heaven wide open. This man from nowhere, Galilee, has just been baptized. He has come to present himself to begin his public ministry. And heaven's first reaction to it is to rip wide open. <clears throat> Number two. It then says a second thing. The spirit... Like a dove, doesn't say that it was a dove. It says it was like a dove. It was visible. It was observable. And the best thing that the, the reporter, that those who were there could do is say, well, you know, it was like a dove. Descending, and my translation says upon him, but the better translation is into him. What is the reaction? This is the more important thing about the baptism. Heaven's reaction to it. Heaven cannot ignore this. It cannot just watch idly by. 
it has to respond. And it has responded with the opening, a tearing in the fabric itself to look down and, in, and for the Spirit to descend into Christ. And then, of course, the announcement, verse 11, in a voice saying this, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. We're going to hear that again at the Mount of Transfiguration, aren't we? Exact same declaration. You are my, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Heaven is pleased with this. What does this reveal about the character of Jesus and the salvation he offers? Well, what he is about to do is with God's full approval. And that continues all the way to the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 has this weird description of the death of the holy servant. And it says this, it pleased God to crush him. This is God's approval for this mission. This is God's approval for this plan. This is God saying all of heaven heartily applauds what we are about to see. And that is why in Philippians, Paul says that he's going to be given the name above all names. And he is going to be given the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Because this is well pleasing to God. Jesus Christ is pleasing to heaven. So much so that they cannot ignore it. Which brings us to the third episode. You know who else is paying careful attention to this? Hell. Heaven is watching this and taking notice. And as it turns out, opposition is also taking notice of this. The temptation of Jesus Verses 12 and 13. And immediately the Spirit impelled him, that's Christ, to go into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast. And the angels were ministering to him. Now I want to say a few things about this episode. He doesn't give us a lot of details. Quite frankly, if you wanted a lot of other details, then you should probably go and read Matthew's account. It's much more in-depth, but let's just think about Mark's purpose. What is it Mark wants you to notice by reading this? There's a couple of things about this. First of all, I just want to comment about where it's taking place. It's taking place in the wilderness. That would be quite significant. In fact, it's quite significant throughout all of Scripture, the death, the death, the uh, description of the wilderness, the desert. It's where the people of God were brought out when they sinned and Moses Moses was trying to lead them to the promised land. Where did they wander for 40 years? In the wilderness. It's this idea of being brought out and chastened in the same way that John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's bringing the people away from the cities, away from the occupied, the more densely occupied areas, bringing them out into the wilderness to deal with their sin. So it's taking place in the wilderness. Not not an insignificant fact. Why? Why is he going out there? Because God has compelled it. Look what it says in verse 12. The Spirit impelled him to go. God wants this encounter. The Spirit of God wants Jesus to have this encounter. With who? Satan. And it's in a most unfavorable area. Not only is it the wilderness, not only is it there for 40 days, but quite frankly, Mark mentions the wild beast. This This is not going to be easy. It is not going to be pleasant. But it is going to be incredibly adversarial. Heaven took notice. The heavens ripped open. The spirit descended like a dove into Christ. And the heavens declared that he is the son of God. And now hell has taken notice and has tempted him until the angels finally appear and they minister to him. What does this reveal about the character of Jesus and the salvation he offers? Listen, if you come to Christ, there is going to be opposition. Mark is going to hit this over and over and over again, all the way to the cross. There's going to be opposition to the gospel. How does it ultimately play out? At the cross with the death of Christ. 
The opposition builds and it builds and it builds until they kill him. Listen, the world is not going to applaud you when you come to Christ. It's not going to applaud you when you submit to Christ. It's not going to take notice and cheer you on when you obey Christ. This is very oppositional. And Mark wants you to see that right on the front. Well, he doesn't stop there. He goes to the fourth episode that's on the back of your notes. And we finally, not finally, but very early on in this gospel, we get to hear some of the teaching. Verses 14 and 15. And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, do what? Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left the nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. So we see our first teaching from this man approved of heaven. And he makes two announcements about the time, and then he gives us three commands. Very consistent, by the way, with what we saw from John the Baptist. First of all, the first thing he says is the time is fulfilled. So the time is proper. What motivates Jesus to act now? This is the time chosen for this. The time is fulfilled. It's not an accident that he's at this moment in history. It's not an accident that he's at this place in history. This is the time for him to be here. And then he tells us something else that's glorious. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. <clears throat> Certainly the Jews of Jesus' day would have been expecting a kingdom. They've heard about it since the days of King David. David is promised. What is David promised? He has promised that an heir will come from him who will sit on his throne forever. <clears throat> This is designed to give them and give us a clear, clear understanding of what is, what is at stake here. This is the perfect time for this announcement. And yes, it is about the kingdom of God and that it is at hand. And because it is at hand, he tells them to do three things. First two, pretty similar to what John the Baptist told them. John has now been taken into custody Mark will use the same words to describe Jesus' arrest. He's been taken into custody. He says, number one, repent. Turn from your sin. Embrace righteousness. Number two, believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And finally, in verse 17, he says, follow me. Beloved, that's the gospel. There it is. Turn from your sin. Forsake it. Pursue righteousness. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. Does it have effect? Well, it had immediate effect in the lives of Peter and Andrew and James and John. In fact, it had so much effect that they left their boats. James and John left their father. There's your Father's Day message. <laughs> Send forth your children to serve the Lord no matter what the cost. <laughs> and what did they do? They went away to do what? They didn't just went away. They went away to follow him. And Peter's going to remind Jesus of that many times in this gospel. He's like, hey, we, we left everything to follow you. There's one great moment where he kind of says, I'd like to know what's in it for me. <laughs> Jesus says, oh, my friend, more than you could possibly imagine. 
What does this reveal about the character of Jesus and the salvation that you are called to? It is a salvation that is designed to make you righteous. It is a, it is a salvation of submission. And it's unfortunately because of our sin and our rebellion, it must be paid for. And the only thing that can pay for it is the death of Jesus on the cross. Mark is setting up everything for that. Everything he talks about is leading us to Calvary. Calvary. It's leading us to that moment at the cross. And so Jesus' message is a simple one. Repent, turn from your sin, embrace righteousness, believe on him, and follow him with all of your strength and all of your heart. Well, that brings us to the fifth episode. Jesus is confirmed by signs and wonders. And this is a remarkable exchange. We talked about this last week. The, the miracles that Jesus do that, that we're going to see in, in the book of Mark, the, the gospel according to Mark are going to be some, some, there are four exorcisms. We're about to read one of them. There are several physical healings where we see all manner of diseases healed. There are natural miracles where he silences a storm, walks on water. But this one is what we would call a casting out of demons. Verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. Probably was invited to do so. Would have shown up. They would have, the, the rabbis who were in that synagogue probably would have invited him to say a few words. Verse 22. And they were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes, and just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What do you have to what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the news about him went out everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So what is Jesus doing when the demon confronts him? What is he doing? He's teaching with authority. He's teaching in a way like they have never heard. He says, it's not like our scribes. You're not like the Pharisees. You are declaring truth boldly and with power. And, uh, and it, as you can see, the opposition to the gospel, the demons don't want that. They don't want there to be a declaration of truth with authority and power. And so this demon, whether one or several, it does use a plural pronoun, we. Uh, that could mean that it's more than one, or it could simply mean that it's speaking with the authority of all of its being. It makes this interesting statement, verse 24. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Now that's a figure of speech. And if you're not, if you weren't alive, in, if you were alive in the first century A.D., you would have understood this as the demon looking at Jesus and saying, "There's no common ground between us. There's no compromise to be had. Either you're going to win, or we're going to win." It's it's a statement that really carries this connotation, this idea that uh, we don't want any reconciliation with you. We don't want to be around you. We don't want to have anything to do with you. And then it says what really is probably a statement. You have come to destroy us. My translation writes it as a question. It's probably more properly a, a statement. You have come to destroy us. We know who you are. 
the Holy One of God. How interesting it is that the demons know who he is even before the people do. And of course, he rebukes him with this really strange thing. He's declaring, you're the Holy One of God, and Jesus says, be quiet. Be quiet. I'm not announcing this yet. Come out of him. And really, what is the, I think, the most important part of this episode is the amazement of the people. The crowd is just amazed. And what do they do? They immediately spread the word of this everywhere they can. And this is going to create all kinds of problems for Jesus with unmanageable crowds, as we're going to see in these next two episodes. So what does this reveal about the character of Jesus and the salvation he offers? Listen, there's no reconciliation to be made with our sin. Jesus is not coming to make nice with our sin. He's not coming to offer some sort of compromise. He is coming to slay our sin. He's coming to kill it. He is coming to make you righteous and clean and pure before God. In him, you are made whole again. The demons understand there's no compromise to be had. None. And that's what they are most terrified in, are terrified of. That the Holy One has come and he has not come to have a peace treaty. He has come to give the terms and to slay sin and its effects on our lives. And this is the very nature of the gospel, isn't it? This is the very nature of your salvation. To, to take our unrighteousness, nail it to the cross, pay for it and raise us up again in newness of life to a life of righteousness and goodness and virtue and nobleness and beauty. The demons know that. And they realize that will require their destruction. Why? Because they're not interested in any compromise. They're not interested in being made new. They are just, they love their sin and they're going to pursue it as hard as they can. And that will be to their destruction. We'll say more about this be quiet in a minute because he's going to repeat this to uh, the leper. But that brings us to the next episode, which is also more signs and wonders. Beginning in verse 29, and immediately after they had come out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick. By the way, that, that would confirm G that Peter uh, had a wife that Peter was married and his mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever and immediately they spoke to him, Jesus, about her. And he, that's Christ, came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand and the fever left her and she waited on them. And when evening had come after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed you know why they waited till after the sunset? Because it's the Sabbath. You can't move up, You can't move around about under the the mosaic. Uh, excuse me, under the Pharisees' laws. You couldn't come out. So they waited for the sun to set, and then they all started coming to him. How many came to him? Verse thirty-three. And the whole city had gathered at the door. That's a, that's unmanageable. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And in the early morning, while he, it was still dark, he arose and went out and departed to a lonely place and was praying there. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And yeah, that's the problem, by the way. He said, yeah, I know. Everyone's looking for me. And he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the town that's nearby in order that I may preach there also. For that is what I came out for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Well, we see, um, we see a couple of things here. Number one, why is Peter's mother-in-law healed? Well, she's healed so she could serve their dinner. He raises her up. Of course, he loves her. He loves Peter. And she immediately begins, as a result of the healing, serving them. And who comes to Jesus for healing because of this? We see this whole scene. They're now mobs forming. 
And the mobs are excited and the mobs are thrilled and they are amazed and they want to see the healings. They want to see the show. And what is Jesus' response to the crowds? Well, quite frankly, it's, it's really a stark contrast in that he pulls away in the night for prayer and announces to his disciples, we've got to go someplace else. We have to go to other cities. I have to preach repentance. I have to preach to believe and follow him. He's got to preach that message. And the unmanageable crowds are not helping. Listen, at this point, they would be ready. The crowds at this point, early in Jesus' ministry, they would be ready for Palm Sunday right now. They would be ready to crown him. They would be ready to take him in. They'd be ready to begin what many of them would hope would be a throwing off of the Romans. They can look at this power. They're amazed by his teaching. They're amazed by the exercise of power. And Jesus is, going, is saying, I've got a different mission than the one you think. I have to arrive in Jerusalem at just the right hour, at just the right time to pay the price that has to be paid for our forgiveness. And they don't see that and they don't understand it. This is a mission that has to be if you and I are to be saved. It reveals about the character of Jesus and the salvation he offers that the cross is where he must go. And what a contrast that these crowds that are loving him right now and can't wait to see him are going to abandon him at the cross. He's going to be at the cross pretty much alone. But right now, they are almost unmanageable. The crowds are so awful. And then he closes out the chapter with this episode. And this will be where we close out the day. Verse 40 through 45, the cleansing of a leper. And a leper came to him, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Very humble, very humble statement. If you are willing. Verse 41, and moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him, something you would never do to a leper, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Listen, this is nothing like the phony healings you see on television. This is nothing like those phony things where the, the charlatan stands up there and says, I'm going to heal your your lame leg, and he says, yeah, why don't you get a little therapy for that, and that'll work itself out, and you'll be able to walk a lot better. There's no therapy. When Jesus heals, it's instantaneous, and it's complete. And it's immediately obvious. But here's the main point of this encounter. That's, that's incredible, but we've just seen that. We've seen Peter's mother-in-law healed. We've seen the demons cast out. He says there were many healings of all kinds in verses 32 and 33. The whole city's coming. What about this one? What's, what's different about this one? Verse 43. And he, that's Jesus, sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. Now, I just want to stop here for a minute. <laughs> What a strange thing to say. I don't want you to tell anybody about this. Jesus is not interested in fame. He is not interested in popularity. He is not pursuing the building of a political cause. For this man to go forth and just explain to everybody what happened to him is going to make it harder. The, the, pre the pressure of the crowd is going to even crush him more to begin to be crowned as king. He said, say nothing except what the law of Moses requires. And here's what the law of Moses required. He had to go to the temple. He had to be examined by the priest. The priest had to declare him clean. And you know what he was now free to do? Worship again with the community. I want you to miss that. He said, listen, just go and do what the priest have to do. And then you can join the community for worship again. The man doesn't do that. Verse 45, but he, that's the leper, went out and began to proclaim it freely. Listen, I'll cut him a little slack. I, I don't know how you stay quiet about this. <laughs> and to spread the news about 
to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. What disease is cured? Leprosy. What's special and unique about leprosy? It makes you ritually unclean. You cannot join in worship. You can't, you can't come into the temple. Jesus said, I made it so that you can go to the temple again and worship the Lord your God. Just go and be approved for that. What is he told to do? Present himself to the priest and remain silent. Unfortunately, he decides to tell everyone. And what is the effect of that? More fame, more fortune, and more opposition to the actual mission. They are ready for Palm Sunday right now, aren't they? They're ready to pick up the palms. They're ready to put him on a donkey. They're ready to send him into Jerusalem. They're ready to hail him as king. They are ready. And Jesus says, you do not understand what I have come to do. The focus is a very singular one. The character of Jesus is he's focused on making you and me righteous before God. He said, I've come to make you righteous before God. And I have to go to the cross to fulfill this. That's where my crown awaits me. My crown does not await me in cheering crowds. My crown does not await me in popularity. It misses every church in America that spends every week counting the number of heads they have. Misses the point. They miss the point. That is not the plan. He said, my crown awaits me in suffering and death. That's where my name will be exalted. Listen, we, we need this more than, we need to refocus on Jesus and who he is and why he came and what is his character and what is his nature more than ever. You know, this came in the mail. It comes to us about once every quarter, I think. Yeah, it comes once a quarter. It's, it's from the Muskegon County Cooperating Churches. And you can see it's about, it's about five pages long. And I, I opened it up and took a look at it. And, you know, it's got all kind of interesting focus. It's, its focus is quite interesting. It's focused on, you know, having more peace among each other. It's focused on, there's a, here, here's a whole page about forestry and soil conservation. Here's something about a, you know, food pantry is, of course, an important ministry. They have that. The Taste of Muskegon, as we know this, the Taste of Muskegon was later, was earlier this month. You missed it. Uh, the great the great summer program, reading programs at the libraries. There's music concerts. There's the Greek Music and Cultural Dance Festival is coming up. Parties in the Park, Wings Over Muskegon Air Show, Boat Life Boat Show, Loads of Grace Golf Tournament, Crop Walk, which is also raising food for those who might, might not need it. Uh, there, is a, there is a night of worship at Hackney Park on July 13th. Um, and then there's a, there's a walk for gun, about to oppose gun violence. You know what is really interesting about these five pages? Jesus' name is not mentioned one time. Not once. They do not, uh, I would say this with all due respect to the Muskegon County Co Co Cooperating Churches, you have lost the narrative. You've lost the narrative and you do not understand what the purpose is. You do not understand the person of Jesus Christ. You do not understand the character of Jesus Christ. You do not understand why he came. You are like the crowds. They are like the crowds that are gathering there with, around the, the Jesus they have created in their image. And now they've created Jesus where they don't even have to mention his name not once. I, I, would, I would implore you to spend time this summer in the book of Mark as much as you can. Listen, if you don't know Christ and you're meeting him for the first time, I envy you. I am jealous of you that you are meeting us. I remember how wonderful that was to meet him for the first time. If you have forgotten your first love, Mark will call you back to that first love. He will call you back to it for a sweet reunion. And if you are faithful and you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength, this will be a time of sweet fellowship with Christ that will just renew you and lift you up even more. The battle for the historical Jesus is more important than it has ever been. And it's not even people who are 
I mean, these people all go to church somewhere. Their churches are all listed on the back. It's time to be, it's time to remember. It's time to remember. Jesus Christ has a character and a nature. He is the way, and his character and his nature is the way of salvation. And it's going to be laid out over and over again for us in the gospel according to Mark. And next week, as we turn our attention, we're going to see continued opposition. The opposition is just going to heighten up. We're going to see an authority. He is exercising authority like no one has ever seen. And then we get to chapter 4 and we get to hear his teachings, his parables of the kingdom. Uh, what, a, what a glorious summer that awaits us. I would encourage you to, to give yourself to it. And enjoy the book of Mark as we head through there this summer. So let's pray to that end. And Lord, we do thank you for the we thank you for your kindness in giving us your son. Uh, we would be undone without him. There would be no hope without his death, burial, and resurrection. I thank you for the clarity of writers like Matthew and Luke and John and, yes, Mark, who point us to the clear person of Jesus Christ and to what is critical for our salvation. Lord, give us a hunger for that. Renew our hunger for that. Oh, what a glorious thing to spend time with Jesus. What a glorious thing for us as a church to come together and spend time with Jesus. So, Lord, uh, open, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see as we enjoy the gospel according to Mark. And in so doing, help us to glorify and exalt the person, the character, the nature of Jesus Christ and the salvation of that he brings. And we ask this very humbly in Christ's name. Amen.